The driving force that motivated me to start developing my dream game was the desire to create a world that feels as though the character actually exists within it. I want to spend time in this world and make it my own. So this week, I started working on a base building mechanic which allows you to place and remove objects in the environment. Howdy, and welcome to Game Endeavor, where I post weekly devlogs for my game Zoe and a Cursed Dreamer. At its core, I'm creating a role-playing game like the ones that I played throughout my childhood. This means that the player will venture out into the world, fight monsters, progress through a story, and interact with the various NPCs. On its own, this is good enough for getting the player to feel immersed in the world, but I want to take it a step further and let them create their own little area where they can stash items, craft cheeses, or just decorate it however they want. But there are various things that can make this a little tricky, such as collision checking to prevent you from placing objects in a wall, showing a preview of the object so that the player has an idea about how it's going to look before placing it in the world, and how to remove objects once they're placed in the world, otherwise I guess they're stuck there forever. I needed to solve all these issues, otherwise I feel like my game would like a big part of the immersive gameplay that I want to achieve. This mechanic alone could potentially add several hours of gameplay for players that enjoy decorating houses or crafting cheeses. My favorite feature about this building mechanic is that it's not going to be strictly grid based for the most part. You will have the option to snap to a grid for those of you that want things to be perfect, but I want to have a lot of freedom when decorating my house. This will be especially useful when decorating with things like flowers and rocks. A grid would make this feel too rigid and unnatural. I still want the option to align to a grid though, otherwise it might be slightly more annoying to create a row of chests side by side, and there are going to be players that want to keep everything nice and tidy. But I don't need a dedicated grid system, I just need to snap an object's position to a grid. Godot's 2D vectors include a snapping function right out of the box, which uses another vector 2 to determine how much of a snap to apply. For example, if I use a vector 2 of 24 on both of the axes, then the object will snap to a 24 by 24 pixel grid. Pretty straightforward. But this by itself causes the object to snap to the intersections of the grid. I need it to snap to the center. So I offset the object by half of the grid size, which will align it to the center. This works, but there's an issue where the snap is being rounded, causing it to transition to the next grid midway through the tile, which feels really awkward. This is fixed by applying half of a tile offset before performing the snap. But then you'll notice that this places the object's position at the center of the grid. But because I'm using Y sorting, the position of my objects are the lowest part of the sprite, which places the object higher up than I want. So I added a customizable offset to be used for each individual object. This is done with the position of a node that I place at the center of where the object sits on the floor. I'm using a shape here for reasons that I will explain shortly. Not everything will be free from the tyranny of the grid however. Things like fences will require it because it's handled through Godot's tile map which is by definition grid based. So anything that requires the auto tile feature will still be grid bound. Speaking of fences though, I made the first ones for this game as well. They're simple wooden ones that are meant to give the town a rustic feel. You'll be able to place these in your area as decorations or to enclose an area for various purposes. Since I'm not using a grid, I need to be especially mindful where the player is placing items in the world to prevent them from placing things down where they shouldn't, otherwise they would be able to place objects inside of walls, over other objects, or even over top of themselves. To prevent this, I need to perform various collision checks to see if an object can be successfully placed. One thing I love about Godot is how straightforward and flexible this process is. With a shape query, I can iterate through an object's collider shapes and use them to perform physics checks to see if any other objects are overlapping that could prevent it from being placed. I use this to look for collisions with the environment as well as other entities like the player. Preventing the player from placing an object where they shouldn't is one thing, but it can be very confusing if they have no visual about whether or not they can place the object, or even what the object they're trying to place would look like in that position. To show the player this valuable information, I need a preview which shows what object they're trying to place, as well as whether or not they can successfully place it. Rather than creating a separate entity for this, I'm actually using the object that is going to be placed, or rather, a disabled version of it. Whenever the player selects a placeable item from their inventory, the item data for that object tells the player what scene it will be placing, and thus what scene it will need as the preview. The object has a method set preview, which disables all of its colliders, otherwise it would cause chaos with the physics engine. It then disables this interaction area, which the player uses to activate the object, for example when they open a chest. And then its color is made transparent, so as not to be mistaken for an actual object. And if this object is designated as a preview object, then every frame it will perform the collision checks mentioned before and adjust its color accordingly. Red if the object can't be placed, otherwise green. The preview never gets placed though. When the player places an object, a new one gets instantiated instead and placed down at the preview's position. 
When the player changes their selective item, the preview is deleted forever, removing it from this plane of existence before it can ever have a chance to realize this potential. But this doesn't mean it's happily ever after for the object that does get placed. Let's say the player misclicks and doesn't place an object exactly where they want. They're probably going to want to remove that object, thus it's going to need to get the axe. So I've created a hatchet item that the player can use to remove objects. I'm still debating on this style though because having tools implies that the player can use them for other tasks such as chopping trees and mining stones. I'm not completely against this implementation, but it will complicate the world building ever so slightly. I'd need to be mindful of how I place trees and rocks in the world so that the player can't remove all of them and make the land look empty. The player would probably be pretty upset if they removed an object and didn't get anything back, especially if they removed a chest with all of their valuable cheeses in it. So when you break an item, a method gets called that allows the object to drop various items. This generates an array of items to be dropped, and by default it will drop an item that can be associated with it, but other items can be appended to this list, such as the contents of a chest. This array of items is then passed into the level spawn method, the same one that enemies use to drop their items, and the player is able to pick everything up. Currently I don't plan to let the player build or remove objects just wherever in the world though, especially in the town, so I need a way to limit where they can build. I've added lots to the game to define areas that are available for the player to build the bases. The main one is going to be in the town so that you can live among the other townsfolk, but I'd also like to have various ones throughout the world that the player can claim and use for themselves. For example, you may have come across an abandoned campsite in the woods and decide to use it as your own secluded base. This is where the shape I mentioned earlier comes into play. I can call a method that checks to see if the object's shape is enclosed by it, which is how I'm checking to make sure that the player is trying to place an object inside of the bounds. The perimeter of the lot is shown to the player using a non-patch rect, which allows me to easily set the size of the lot and Godot will tile this node so that it outlines it. The grid is also a non-patch rect, but instead of being empty, it's a grid and set to tile so that it fills the area. In a previous devlog, I showed how I tried using a reveal shader on my roof transitions to make it seem like the roof was peeling away to reveal the interior. I decided to use a fade transition instead, but it was still useful to learn because I knew it would have various uses elsewhere. Well, I want to show a grid to the player to give them an idea about how an object is going to snap to it, but I don't want the entire thing to always be visible. I think it would be a nice effect if part of the grid was only visible near the object where the player is trying to place it. So I used the reveal shader to accomplish this. It needed some minor tweaking because the logic of where and how much of the fade to apply is slightly different, but it's pretty much the same concept. The player's base wasn't the only thing that gets some extra content this week, so let's have a warm welcome for Truffles the Pig. A beloved member of the town who is not bacon so don't even think about it. He roams around the town looking for food and loves to play in the mud. He'll even be able to follow you around as a pet when you go fighting through the dungeons. We also designed some more NPCs during this week's stream and it was one of the best we've ever had. It was the first time we've ever had more than 100 people watching as well so thank you to everyone that showed up and helped us design this game. We created a few new NPCs including a hilarious story arc for the old man that involved derpy squirrels which was so funny that I had to make a discord emoji just for them. We also designed Teddy's older sister, which is pretty exciting. She's a towering blacksmith that looks intimidating if you don't know her, but she has a heart of gold much like Teddy. She will sell you various weapons and accessories throughout the game and help you upgrade your equipment. With these new NPCs and the base building mechanic implemented, I feel like we're making excellent progress towards having the demo ready by March of 2021. It's finally time to start working on our first dungeon so that we can close our gameplay loop and begin working on polishing everything up for y'all to start playing. I post a new devlog every Saturday, so if you're new, then join the sub club and dingling that bell to get notified for future videos. There's a playlist here to catch you up on everything that I've done so far, and I will see you there.